Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today, we're reviewing the Samsung Odyssey G7. Now you might be wondering, hang on a moment, didn't you already review the Odyssey G7 way back in 2020? And of course, you'd be correct. But late last year, Samsung released a new Odyssey G7, which is a little bit confusing for buyers. However, it is quite a bit different in terms of its specifications. This new version is called the LS28A G700, usually with even more letters and numbers after that, depending on your region. But for this review, I'll be shortening it to the S28 model. This version brings with it a 28 inch 4K 144Hz IPS panel for high end gamers. And it is being advertised by Samsung as things like the 28 inch Odyssey G70A 4K UHD or the 28 inch Odyssey G7 UHD in various countries. In contrast, the original G7, otherwise known as the LC27G75 T model for the 27 inch variant, is a 1440p 240Hz curved VA display. So you really don't want to be confusing the C27G7 model with the S27A G7 model, as they are very different products. I'm a little disappointed that Samsung has ruined the naming scheme for the Odyssey G7 instead of G7 referring to a single type of monitor that we can all easily remember and refer to. It can now mean all sorts of things, but don't want to get caught up in that too much. Just a quick warning at the start of this video so you don't accidentally buy the wrong monitor. The Odyssey G7 S28 is one of several new generation 4K 144Hz IPS displays for gaming, mirroring the specs of popular monitors such as the Gigabyte M28U, and in fact the panel used here appears to be the same model from Inelux. This new generation is the most affordable yet, and the S28 is no exception, frequently being available at $700 US, which is in the ballpark of its competitors, and a fair bit cheaper than the $900 plus monitors from previous years. This particular review is brought to you by Hardware Unboxed Patreon and Floatplane members. We tried to organize a review sample from Samsung directly, but they didn't respond to our last email. Given Samsung's recent poor history of quality control issues, I especially wanted to test this display to see if any of the same issues are also present here. So I wasn't gonna take silence as an answer and instead bought this monitor for testing. If you wanna support independent hardware testing and have us continue to buy the products we need to review, consider signing up, links in the description. The design for the Odyssey G7 S28 model is similar to the original Odyssey G7, except refined in several ways. Obviously, this monitor isn't curved, unlike the 1440p 240Hz variants, and to me, that is a huge improvement as I wasn't a fan of the 1000R curve for this format of display. But other areas, like the front-facing RGB LED elements, have also been refined. I think the chin on this monitor is a little too large personally, but at least the rest of the bezels are normal in size. The stand is a basic affair. It does support the full range of motion, including height, tilt, swivel, and pivot support. However, the stand legs and pillar are entirely coated in a fairly average black plastic, so it's nothing special from a build standpoint. I do like the design on the rear. Samsung have gone with the same type of gamer influence style, but the patterning is pleasing, and the RGB LED core lighting element in the center looks pretty cool in my opinion, certainly a better than average implementation of RGB. As a 4K 144Hz display, port selection is important, and Samsung have delivered here. The G7 S28 includes one DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC, as well as two real HDMI 2.1 ports. The HDMI 2.1 ports are 40 gigabits per second, not the full 48 gigabits per second, but this makes absolutely no real world difference, as these HDMI 2.1 ports have more than enough bandwidth at 40 gigabits per second for full 4K 144Hz at 10-bit RGB. This this means support for the full panel capabilities with inputs like game consoles. The OSD is controlled through a directional toggle and uses the same format as other Samsung monitors. The range of features here is decent, including several color controls and some game specific stuff like crosshairs for cheating. Unlike the VA based Odyssey monitors, there's no VRR control setting as it's not required. There's also three additional face buttons for quick access to some settings if you want to use them. Looking at response times, the Odyssey G7 S28 is similar to other Odyssey monitors in that you can't adjust the overdrive settings when Adaptive Sync is enabled. The vast majority of buyers will be using Adaptive Sync with this display when hooked up to a PC, so I'm only going to test this mode. You can adjust the overdrive when the free sync option is disabled in the OSD, but I don't think any of those settings are relevant. At 144Hz, the G7 S28 performs pretty well. The response time average registers in under 5 milliseconds, and the level of overdrive 
overshoot is minimal for the majority of transitions. This leads to a really solid cumulative deviation average of under 500, right where I like to see modern IPS displays. Refresh compliance of over 90% is excellent too, suggesting this panel is comfortably capable of refreshing at 144Hz with response times to match. As we move down the variable refresh rate range, as gamers playing with variable refresh enabled might do, response performance is pretty consistent. The response time average only increases from 4.9 to 5.08 milliseconds at 60 Hz, which is a very small difference. However, overshoot does increase, and there are no real signs of variable overdrive being used here. Down at 60 Hz, the inverse ghosting rate is at 32%, which is around the level you will notice some inverse ghosting artifacts in practice. However, based on my observations, any inverse ghost trails are faint and hard to notice while gaming, which is reflected in a cumulative deviation value that isn't too high compared to what some high overshoot monitors may have. The question here is whether the G7S28 has a single overdrive mode experience, and I think it does. You can happily game on this display from 144Hz through to 60Hz with only minor visual artifacts at the lower end of the refresh range. Having the ability to adjust overdrive settings may have led to further improvements at 60Hz, but for the most part Samsung's choice to lock the overdrive controls is only a minor annoyance and doesn't lead to poor performance. When compared to other monitors showing their best performance at their highest refresh rates, the G7S28 performs as expected. It's slightly slower than the two other displays we've tested to use the same Interlux panel, the Gigabyte M28U and the ASUS VG28UQL1A, but it also has lower overshoot than those displays. It's a bit of a much of a muchness to be honest, and all three will be virtually identical while gaming. The Odyssey also ends up marginally ahead of the EVE Spectrum 4K, which uses an LG panel, while performance is much better than most of today's 32-inch 4K monitors. On average across the refresh range, again, the G7S28 is basically identical to the M28U and VG28UQL1A. It's a little bit slower and has a little bit less overshoot, so you could make the case it's somewhat better optimized. This is where the 28-inch 4K monitors tend to pull away from the LG-based alternatives like the EVE Spectrum and 27GN950. This newer display type is that bit better at lower refresh rates, which creates a more balanced experience, but we are talking about small differences. What isn't as much of a small difference is to the Odyssey G7 1440p 240Hz model. This variant is quite a bit faster, both in terms of response times, which are 28% better, but also in terms of refresh rate. It provides a clearer image, especially at high refresh rates that the G7 S28 can't do. Cumulative deviation is right in line with the M28U and VG28UQL1A. Only a couple of units separate these monitors, which is to be expected as the overdrive settings and panel are all very similar. This gives us a mid-tier modern IPS experience, which is exactly what you want from this technology today, and the only way Samsung could have improved performance further would be through variable overdrive. At 120Hz, the G7S28 delivers great performance, so if you're thinking of using this display with a modern console, it's a great choice. Once again, it's not really any different to other monitors that use the same panel, but it's still decent. At 60Hz, same story, overshoot is a little high for my liking, but performance overall is great and overshoot artifacts are minimal. Input latency is good, especially for processing delay, which is negligible, and a mere fraction of a millisecond at 144Hz. The main limiting factor here is the refresh rate. You'll only achieve a smoother and more responsive experience with a higher refresh rate display, something like the 240Hz options in this chart. Also, I should note that input latency is much higher when using the G7S28 at a fixed 60Hz. I'd recommend setting the display to a higher refresh rate if possible. Power consumption was similar to other IPS monitors of today, and I tested with the RGB lighting disabled. No causes for concerns here, and if anything, the S28 is a bit better than average. The G7 S28 does include backlight strobing, but it's hardly worth talking about due to numerous issues. The mode itself is very limited, only being available as a single setting with no further tuning possible, so no fine tuning of strobe length or timing. It also doesn't work with variable refresh rates enabled. But the biggest issue is simply the visual quality. There's a significant amount of strobe crosstalk, which leads to a blurry double image. In my opinion, this mode is worse than simply using the monitor without any strobing at all, so I wouldn't recommend using it. 
For color performance, we kind of know what to expect to some degree from our previous reviews of monitors like the M28U. This particular panel is wide gamut, but to a more limited wide gamut than other displays of today. DCI-P3 coverage, for example, is only 93% versus the 98% plus some other displays provide, and Adobe RGB coverage is limited as well. We end up with just 69% Rec 2020 coverage, nice, one of the lowest results measured among the high-end monitors in this chart, though similar to its competitors. Samsung's factory calibration is average, using the default out-of-the-box mode. The color temperature was very accurate with no discernible tint, however there's poor adherence to sRGB gamma which leads to some delta E issues. The G7 S28 also does not clamp the wide color gamut down to sRGB or Rec. 709 by default, so there is a bit of oversaturation for everyday SDR content like YouTube videos. I wouldn't describe it as significant oversaturation, but it's not accurate going on the Delta E results from our testing. When compared to other monitors, the S28's factory grayscale performance is below average, though similar to its ASUS competition. Color checker results are more mid-table, but in both charts the S28 is handily beaten by Gigabyte's M28U, which has better out-of-the-box results. Samsung do advertise factory tuning for this display and a calibration report is included. The most accurate mode I could find is the sRGB mode, and this is how I'd recommend most people use the monitor for SDR content. The sRGB mode does clamp the gamut down to the correct color primaries, reducing oversaturation, although there are still a few inaccuracies. Unfortunately though, grayscale performance is largely unchanged from the default configuration, so sRGB gamma performance is still on the poor side. When we get to color checker performance, the sRGB mode is only capable of a Delta E ITP of 7, which is slightly below average among the sRGB modes I've tested, and not quite good enough for me to class the display as actually factory calibrated. This mode is very usable, but for true accuracy, it still needs a full calibration. As always, our full calibration results after using Portrait Display's CalMan software are very good, especially for sRGB where there are no lingering issues. The only main problems were for the P3 color space, the S28 can't fully cover the P3 gamut, so performance at the top end is still off where it should be. This limits the versatility of the display as a monitor for content creators using P3, but it's still fine for content consumption. The ICC profile we create during the review is available for Patreon and Floatplane members. SDR brightness is mediocre, topping out at just 313 nits. This should still be fine for most use cases, but those in really bright environments may not find that to be enough. Minimum brightness is good though, sufficient for use in dark environments. The contrast ratio I recorded with my G7 S28 unit was very good for an IPS monitor, at 1160 to 1, better than my M28U and especially VG28 UQL 1A units. This panel clearly has some variance to it, so perhaps don't expect every model to come with this contrast ratio. Performance is also similar to monitors using other panels like the Eve Spectrum 4K. As is usual for this section of our reviews, the usual disclaimer applies here about contrast actually being poor overall. Monitors like the Odyssey G7 1440p panel with VA technology easily provide over double the contrast ratio, delivering deeper blacks. Viewing angles are good as expected from an IPS panel, and the fact that it's flat versus the original G7 makes it much easier to view at off angles. Uniformity was very solid as well, only a few small deviations across the entire panel, not enough to really be noticeable in practice. This is great from a 4K monitor that you might want to use for a bit of productivity work. Samsung do advertise the Odyssey G7 S28 as an HDR monitor, and it has received Display HDR 400 certification. This is a downgrade from the 1440p 240Hz G7, which features Display HDR 600. As a result, the S28 ends up as a fake HDR monitor. It doesn't get bright enough in the HDR mode, topping out at just 440 nits. It does have local dimming, but only a pathetic 8 edge lit zones, which creates a terrible HDR experience with massive blooming and an insufficient contrast ratio. It also falls just short of the wide gamut requirements I'd ideally like to see from an HDR display. While an edge lit locally dimmed monitor will deliver a better than SDR experience in rare circumstances, I think it's best not to think of the S28 as an HDR capable monitor at all. The HDR experience is bad and miles off a true HDR panel, which is either self lit or has sufficient full array local dimming zones.
The final section of this review is new for 2022 and we're calling it the Hub Essentials Checklist. This is a series of checks to assess a monitor for key feature inclusions and misleading advertising, measuring the listed specs and features compared to our testing results. This is in response to the growing trend of misleading advertising and dodgy specifications, such as the recent destruction of HDMI 2.1 branding. It also allows us to assess more thoroughly the areas where past Samsung monitors have failed in particular, like with flickering and pixel inversion. As we scroll through the checklist, there are only a few problematic areas in the top sections. Samsung advertises factory tuning, but in my testing it fell short of the performance required for me to describe it as factory calibrated. The sRGB mode is good, but has locked settings such as white balance, which is a common annoyance. For motion performance, Samsung exaggerates performance by claiming this is a one millisecond monitor. It can almost hit one milliseconds for the absolute fastest transitions when measuring using an older, outdated test methodology, but I think it's disingenuous to call it a one millisecond monitor when the real average performance is more like five milliseconds. Even Interlux don't advertise this class of panel as one millisecond. Their product listing suggests 3.5 milliseconds, which is accurate using the older 10 to 90 test method without gamma correction. Samsung should have used that number. Other issues include Samsung locking overdrive controls when adaptive sync is enabled and a poor backlight strobing mode. The real kicker for Samsung is advertising it as an HDR monitor when performance suggests it's a fake HDR display. This heavily penalizes Samsung in the checklist, which wouldn't have happened had they not advertised HDR. However, in a positive note, I did not experience any pixel inversion or flickering issues, which have plagued previous Samsung Odyssey displays. Fundamentally, this display uses a totally different, much higher quality panel that doesn't exhibit noticeable defects here or with other displays using the same panel. Overall, the Samsung Odyssey G7 S28 model is a really good display and it's more competently put together than the other Odyssey monitors I've reviewed over the last few years. No flickering issues, no pixel inversion, just a solid experience using an IPS panel that we've seen used in other displays with great success. It's a shame Samsung weren't willing to send one out for a review, instead forcing us to buy one for testing. But there's really a lot to like here. Response performance is very good, so gaming it up to 4K 144Hz is nice and clear, with only a few minor artifacts at lower refresh rates. Samsung provides true HDMI 2.1 support, so there's no compatibility issues with today's consoles. And then on top of this, the color experience is generally decent. It's a nice flat IPS panel with great viewing angles and an above average contrast ratio for an IPS. It also has a functional sRGB mode to tame the wide gamut, so the monitor looks good for SDR content consumption. The panel and overall experience is nicely optimized for gaming in particular, and there's no area I can point to that significantly harms this experience. Adaptive Sync works, the resolution is great, and this sort of display is highly specced, so it should last for a while. It's not ridiculously expensive either, like early 4K 144Hz displays, and those were even lacking key features like HDMI 2.1, which the G7 S28 has. There are some weaknesses to this monitor though. While the IPS panel is decent, it's not the most versatile for content creation due to its more limited wide gamut support. Monitors such as the EVE Spectrum 4K provide near full P3 coverage, where the G7 S28 does not. I still think the Odyssey is a good choice for general productivity work, but creators needing accurate wide gamut coverage from their gaming monitor should look elsewhere. Samsung also failed 11 of 36 checklist items, half of which are attributable to Samsung advertising HDR capabilities but delivering terrible HDR performance. When buying, just think of this as an SDR display. Up against this competition, I can definitely justify buying the G7 S28 and recommending it in some instances. When available at $700 US like it is right now, it's cheaper than the ASUS Tough Gaming VG28 UQL1A for very similar performance in all aspects. I also think it delivers better bang for buck than more expensive displays like the EVE Spectrum 4K, which is $200 more, and while it is better in some areas, it's not good enough to justify the price difference. The final major comparison is to the Gigabyte M28U we've been recommending for a while now. The G7 S28 is very similar in how it performs, but the M28U is slightly cheaper, and it's available at $650 US. Most of the time, I just get the M28U, but there are a couple of occasions I would buy the Samsung model instead. One is that the G7 S28 is more often in stock. The M28U is quite hard to find right now, so availability might dictate your purchase, and I still think $700 US is a great price for Samsung's offering. The G7 also has a sufficient bandwidth HDMI 2.1 port, allowing for better compatibility with the PlayStation 5, making it the better choice for console gamers.
Anyway, that's it for this review of the Samsung Odyssey G7 S28 model. I enjoyed doing this review, and thanks to all our Patreon Floatplane members who do support the channel directly and allow us to buy these sorts of products for review. If you're interested in supporting the channel and our independent testing, please consider signing up. You will gain access to things like our Discord community, where you can chat about monitors, ask me questions, do all that good stuff. We also have behind-the-scenes videos. Uh, we have monthly live streams, all that good stuff. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.